Recruitment Part 1. By the 16th century, the Sultan governed his domains largely, through the slaves of the port and Apos. These were the men whom he had, recruited to serve as ministers, provincial governors or troops, and, whom he paid through the treasury or by the allocation of fiefs. It, was, however, a system of government that had taken two centuries, to evolve, an account of how the earliest sultans governed their principality, and who entered their service can only be brief and highly speculative. The 15th century chronicles present the first ruler, Osman, d. circa 1324, as distributing lands and commanderships to members of his family and to the warriors in his entourage. The names of the warriors seem, in fact, to be inventions, deriving from toponyms in northwestern Anatolia one rather than from accurate historical memory, but the idea that Osman delegated powers to his family and soldier companions might nonetheless be true. The same practices, probably continued into the reign of his son, or Han, circa 1324-62. The names of his four brothers and a sister appear as witnesses to his trust. Deed of 1324, the Byzantine chronicle of John Kanakuzanos mentions his brother, Pazerlu, as a commander at the Battle of Pelican. In 1328, and his son Suleiman Pasha acted as a semi-independent military commander until his death in 1357.2 his son Halil seems to have been governor of lands along the Gulf of Izmit in the late 1350s. The impression is of an informal mode of government, with offices, shared among members of the ruling family and its entourage. This system very probably came to an end during the reign of Murad I, 1362-89. Murad, it seems, was the first sultan to execute his brothers, with the result that the Ottoman realms were no longer the shared patrimony of all members of the ruling family. Sultan's sons continued to act as provincial governors and army commanders, but, strictly under the tutelage of their fathers, and without the freedom of action that Suleiman Pasha had apparently enjoyed. Another factor bringing a change in the mode of government was, the expansion of Ottoman territory and the emergence of the marcher lords. As the Ottoman realms became larger, the conquering lords acquired lands and revenues in the new territories, which, established them as local powers, with their own troops and retainers. The foremost of these lords was Evrenos, d. 1417, who, during Murad's reign, acquired vast land holdings in Macedonia, which his descendants were to retain until the 20th century. Three other marcher lords, notably the families of Michael, Malkok IV, and Turahan, established themselves in the newly conquered lands in Europe in the late 14th and early 15th centuries. Quite possibly there was a similar phenomenon in Anatolia, but the sources are too meager to permit anything more than speculation. As Evrenos and other conquerors established themselves in the new territories, another family, the Chanderleys, emerged as both military leaders and political advisors to the sultans. The first of this line, Haradine Halil, d. 1387, combined the roles of army commander and vizier to Murad I for this reason, Ottoman tradition regards him as the first grand vizier, a post which his descendants were to occupy until 1453.5 at the same time. The Ottoman conquerors frequently did not remove the dynasties that had ruled in pre-Ottoman times, but instead maintained them as vassals under Ottoman suzerainty. These developments made Murad I's position different from that of his father and grandfather, in the sense that he no longer had to share authority with his brothers, he was evidently stronger than they. At the same time, however, the appearance of the marcher, lords, and the continued rule of semi-independent local dynasties, clearly limited his power. He was not an absolute ruler, but rather the most powerful in a confederation of great lords, who were his allies, and vassals rather than his servants, to establish their own position. Therefore, Murad and his successors had to secure a following who, were subordinates rather than confederates, and whose loyalty to the, Ottoman dynasty was unquestionable. The source of such a following, in the absence of modern institutions, could only be the sultan's, household, and it was largely through members of their households, employed as governors or soldiers, that the Ottoman sultans came to, govern the empire. Islamic law and tradition combined with the particular circumstances of the Ottoman dynasty to define the nature of the imperial household, the exclusion from government of the female line, the practice of fratricide between 1362 and 1595, and the seclusion of the princes thereafter made the sultan the unchallenged patriarch of the dynasty, severely limiting the role of the imperial family at large. Only the sultan's sons had a share in government after 1362, and then, only under surveillance as provincial governors. In the absence of blood relatives on whom to confer office or devolve power, the sultan had to turn to other members of the household. Law and precedent determined who these were to be. Islamic law permits slavery and, by creating a category of licensed 
Slaves, makes it possible for them to carry out transactions on their owner's behalf. Slaves could therefore become trusted and important figures. Furthermore, despite their servile status, they could, through membership of an elite household, occupy an elevated social rank. The slave household, therefore, became a feature of Islamic society. And Islamic rulers had, from early Abbasid times in the 8th century, created armies of slave troops, and used slaves in the government of their realms. This was true also of the Seljuks of Rum and probably also of the successor dynasties that had ruled in Anatolia before the Ottoman conquest. The Seljuks in the 13th century had employed slaves as troops and as military commanders, in the palace, and in the government, and had even established a school in Konya. For their education. Six, the Byzantine emperors, too, employed bodies of foreign troops whose origins set them apart from the ordinary subjects of the empire. Seven, with these precedents, it was perhaps inevitable that the Ottoman sultans should form their household on the institution of slavery and the employment of foreigners in Apos. Furthermore, with the elimination of the sultan's adult blood relations from the household and government, his dependence on slaves became more pronounced. Recruitment into the imperial service, usually, therefore, met recruitment as a slave. Islamic law is clear on who may and may not be enslaved. In the first place, it forbids the enslavement of Muslims, although slaves who convert to Islam do not lose their servile status. Secondly, it defines which non-Muslims may legally be enslaved. For this purpose, it divides the world into the Muslim and non-Muslim realms, and affords no protection to the life or property of persons living in the non-Muslim world. This means in practice that it is permissible to kill or enslave non-Muslims living under a non-Muslim sovereignty. The status of a non-Muslim living under a Muslim sovereignty is different. By virtue of paying a capitation tax levied on adult males, they enjoy the status of protected infidels. The law protects their lives and property and they may not be enslaved. Slaves, therefore, originate as captives from the non-Muslim world. Once brought into the realm of Islam, they become property that their owner may sell, hire out, bequeath or give as a gift. The status is also heritable. The children of slaves have servile status, but if one of the parents is free, the child follows the status of its mother. Owners can also free slaves by a simple verbal declaration or by a number of other devices. Eight Slaves could therefore enter a household by capture, purchase, inheritance or gift, and the Ottoman sultans acquired slaves by these means presumably from the early decades of the empire. By the end of the 14th century, however, recruitment on a large scale had become systematic, using two methods. The first of these was to impose a levy on the captives which Ottoman soldiers brought back from raids and wars in Christian territories. The law that gives the Muslim sovereign the right to on a fifth share of the spoils of war justified the practice, although there is no evidence to suggest that the sultans made the levy at precisely this rate. It seems quite possible that the practice began during time of Osman or Orhan, but Ottoman chronicles locate its origin in the reign of Murad I. They attribute it to Chandarli Hajjadeen and a certain Kara Rustam of Karaman who, they assert, advised Murad, take one-fifth of the prisoners coming from raids, and if someone does not have five prisoners, take twenty-five oxes for each prisoner apostrophe. Nine it is doubtful whether this tale is in detail true. However, raids into Europe became more intense and widespread during Murad's reign, increasing the number of prisoners available. At the same time, Murad needed to bolster his own political supremacy by increasing the size of his household, and these factors perhaps combined to necessitate the institution of a formal and regular levy during his reign. The main purpose of the levy was to provide recruits to the Janissaries, the Sultan's household infantry, and the chroniclers in fact tend to associate the establishment of the levy with the foundation of this corps. Other recruits, however, went to serve directly in the palace or, after their establishment at an uncertain date, in one of the six divisions of household cavalry.